Thank you for being patient as we work out the technical issues with broadcasting live. It was baptism by fire, and we are properly singed. Please accept this service, which does not include the offering of communion, uh, which was live on the service, but with compromised sound. It does have Pastor Karen's communion meditation. God bless. Good afternoon, folks, all of our good friends and family at church. We miss you, and we're praying that everybody will be safe and do what we're supposed to do. And most of all, when we go back to church, let's wear our name tags, because we may forget <laughs> us, each one. Little kids won't, but we will. And be safe, and we miss you, love you. And now it's Butch's turn. Uh, thank you. I'd like to say prayers for all the people in the world and all the people in the United States and all of our friends at church and everybody who's suffering from the Bye. plague we've got going. Uh, we're looking forward to coming back to church and seeing you all. We love you all. I, lo I love you guys and especially the pretty girls. <laughs> I'm, you know, I miss my hugs. Thank you. Butch and Rosie Goodwin. Butch and Rosie Goodwin. Hi everyone, we miss all of you. We've been just sitting at home and missing going out and running into people and seeing everybody, especially our faith family at church. No more church service for a while. But anyway, we've just been sitting here quietly trying to watch all the coverage of the virus. Not much fun. So stay well and safe, and we'll look forward to the time we can all be together again. Bye. So long. Hi, this is Carol and Tim sending our greetings from Hasita Beach. Hello, everybody. We miss you all, and please continue to stay healthy, and we hope to see you very soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Good morning. It's Karen Love Basinger again. I understand the sound wasn't coming through when I uh, gave my message, my communion meditation. So I hope that you can hear me this time around. Uh, so we'll go through it again. Uh, I'd like to read the scripture. That's from Matthew, the 21st chapter, 
the first through the eleventh verses. Matthew 21. This is about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm, what we now call Palm Sunday, as we begin Holy Week. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, and they placed their coats, their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Thank you, God, for your gracious gift of Scripture. Well, that scene sounds like a Hollywood spectacular, right? So who's the hero of this story other than Jesus? Who's the best role model for us? Well, it's clearly not the disciples. They're just too human. You know, they might be standing with Jesus now and kind of soaking up the glory, but in a matter of days, one of them is going to betray him and another one will deny him. And in just a, you know, the chapter before this chapter, in uh, Matthew, they had, an ar- they had an argument about, well, which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom? Actually, this whole trip was making them kind of nervous because Jesus was talking about death and suffering, and that wasn't their uh, idea of what was going to happen. They wanted a regime change, and that was just like disappearing like a mist in the wind. So they're falling off the bandwagon faster than the speed of light. They'd seen a lot, they'd done a lot, they'd listened a lot to Jesus, but in the end, when Jesus gives them the faith test, the final exam, it turns out they don't have a clue. That could describe a lot of us a lot of the time. We've followed Jesus for years now. We've sat in church. we dropped some dollars in the collection plate. We've taught a class here and there. And we've served on some committees, and we've done our part. We're good people, right? But although some of us, no doubt, have made it to the cross, and some of us have endured the fires of suffering and embraced the faith test and passed it convincingly, too many of us don't even know, you know what it's like to follow Jesus into the storm and are we bailed out altogether as the storm approached. So the disciples are just too human and they're not the role model we're looking for. Nor are the crowds. They're worse than the disciples. They're curious, but they're not committed. In fact, their loyalties can be bought and sold. And they're shouting, Hosanna to the king to the son of David today, but soon they're going to reject him and they're going to be clamoring for his death. New Testament scholar Eugene Boring points out that the members of the crowd know the truth about Jesus, but they cannot bring themselves to do the truth. So maybe we should turn to the religious leaders in our story. No, they were corrupt, mean-spirited, and jealous. And when Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus, they conspired to put Lazarus right back in that tomb where they thought he belonged. And they offered and took bribes and they solicited false testimony. They created a bogus trial. They sent an innocent man to his death. Today, about 95% of pastors and priests and rabbis and spiritual leaders in this country are without a doubt caring and committed people, working hard. But it's the other 5% who abuse their flock, who abuse children, who fill the television screens asking for donations, many of which... You know, their viewers are from fixed income uh, situations, and they use the, and then these leaders use these donations to pay for lawsuits or sleep jets or palatial mansions or a fleet of cars. These are the false shepherds who someday will find themselves facing God about it, and who in the meantime cause the unbelievers to avoid the church. So what's left? You know, there's the different 
categories of the humans in the story, there's nothing left except that donkey. This animal, this donkey, can teach us a lot because she's the creature who carried Christ into the world. The donkey plays her role as she was created to do and as it was intended. So we can learn a lot about serving Christ from watching this donkey. So maybe this is the one time that I, as your pastor, will tell you it's good, it's the best thing to be an ass. Because that's what it's all about, carrying Christ into the world. The donkey was a Christ-bearer, or a Christopher, de uh, derived from the Greek Christos, combined with Pharaoh to bear, to carry. Today's an opportunity to take that name, to take that identity, Christopher, Christopher, feminine, as our own. By doing so, we're committing to bearing Christ into the world. So being Christopher means serving Christ without taking a victim attitude of being overburdened and overwhelmed, but rather accept that your role as a disciple is to carry that burden. Serve Christ humbly without caring who gets the credit or the glory. Following Christ's direction, being willing to go where Christ wants you to go, not where you want to go. Not getting spooked by the crowds, the noise, the attention. And taking Christ fearlessly into enemy territory, loving unconditionally. Never asking Christ, get off my back. Being obedient to the Christ who holds the reins. So as we carry Christ into the world, we're challenged to do a particular kind of work to be a Christian and to show a distinctively Christian lifestyle. They'll know we're Christians by our love. Let our love be genuine, resisting what is evil and holding fast to what is good. It involves rejoicing in hope, being patient in suffering and persevering in prayer. To live in this way means that we take care of each other. We extend hospitality to strangers and we even go so far as to bless those who persecute us. It means that when our whole city is in turmoil, as Jerusalem was on Palm Sunday, and the people around us are saying, who's that, who's that? We'll be able to share with them a story that will change their story, just as it's changed our story. If we can pull this off and model our lives on the one character in this melodrama that deserves emulation, we'll discover the joy that comes from carrying Christ. We'll know the glory of hearing Hosanna's praise to God the fulfillment of close contact with Jesus, the excitement of accepting a challenge, and the deep satisfaction of knowing that we're walking in the way of God. There's no better role that we could be asked to perform. Thanks be to God. Amen.